Welcome to the Travel Like a Boss podcast, where we interview location-independent entrepreneurs that travel the world like a boss by being their own boss. Here's your host, Johnny FD. All right, so to the guys watching on YouTube, this is a treat because we normally never uh, record the the podcast video-wise, but I got Nate Hake here. Hey, how are you doing, guys? And he's such a good-looking guy. I was like, <laughs> I have to have him on camera. Plus, this $20 night Airbnb is awesome so enjoy uh, this talk i'll invoice you for my modeling fee ah, i love it all right hey everyone this is johnny and welcome to episode 231 of the travel like a boss podcast i'm here today with nate hake from travellemming.com how you doing how you doing guys <laughs> thanks for having me on johnny yeah i'm really excited so nate is most famous for being a very good looking guy <laughs> <laughs> but aside from that <laughs> He uh, publishes a annual report called the Emerging. What is it? The Emerging, the Emerging Destination Awards. Travel Destinations Awards. Yeah, that's right. And it's not just you picking it out of your butt. It's <laughs> actual like some pretty big name travel bloggers that you get to be the the judges, right? Yeah. So we get tours and boards around the world to help us identify places that are really wonderful tourism destinations, but that don't have that many tourists, um, or at least are able to handle more tourists than they have, because we, we think that over tourism is a problem and a part of the solution has to be for people to spread out. And then we take those nominations to a panel of some of the top travel judges on the planet, and then we publish out the awards uh, every year. So they'll come out in early November for this year. Yeah, I think that's super cool that you do that. I mean, Ed, the reason why I wanted to have you on today, for it was a couple of reasons. First, you know, we've been having fun hanging out here in Georgia for a while. It's not just the good looks. <laughs> not just the good looks. <laughs> <laughs> but I feel like there is a, a, lot, like a lot of things to, to go over today. I mean, first is I definitely want to know what some of these top emerging destinations are uh, and talk about them. Second... I also want to talk about just over tourism in general and kind of how that's, you know, kind of ruining some cities. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and then I also want to talk about this great like kind of idea that you had of taking a travel blog that was, you know, really just mm -hmm. you writing about, you know, just like a normal travel blog and making it into this big thing, this big collaboration, not only with other top travel bloggers, but also with the tourism boards and really making it into a successful, viable business and not just a, another travel blog. Sure. Yeah. So uh, let's first talk about how we met, actually. How did we meet? Can you want to remind me? <laughs> was, it, was it in uh, Ukraine? Uh, yeah, it would have probably been at one of the nomad meetups in uh, Kiev. Yeah, that's funny because the two episodes ago, we had on the other Nate, Nathan. Nathaniel. Oh, yeah, Nathan Aguilera, foodie flashbacker, good friend of mine. Yeah, we yeah. met at the same time, I think. Yeah, that's probably right. Yeah. yeah. And we now we, we're all hanging out in Georgia for the last month. It's kind of cool. Yeah, it's been, uh, it's been fun. Both Kiev and Tbilisi are really very different cities, but very good digital nomad cities. Yeah, and I think for different reasons. Yeah. I, I would say Tbilisi is better for normal people who want like a comfortable, easy life. Yeah. Where everything, most things kind of work, everything's kind of cheap. I think Kiev is for people who like want that grittiness, like something really different. And I don't think life is very easy in Ukraine. Yeah, I mean, and Kiev's a much bigger city than Tbilisi, right? And the other thing that Tbilisi has that Kiev doesn't is access to all of these wonderful mountain destinations and stuff. There's not a ton immediately accessible outside of Kiev that you'd want to go see, other than Chernobyl, of course. Yeah, and I guess, like, definitely nature-wise, Ukraine is kind of lacking on that. I know they have, the, like, some really beautiful mountains, but they're hard to get to. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Uh, so let's talk about some... Okay, well, I guess first, like, what are your, what are your thoughts on over-tourism? Like, is, has it been a problem for a while, or do you think this is just new, like, hot topic, or do you think it's an actual trending problem? I mean, if you look at the statistics, it definitely, I mean, it has been a problem for, for some time. It's getting a lot of attention now for, for a number of reasons. One is that travel generally, international travel has been on the rise for a while now, driven by a bunch of trends, including a desire among the younger generations to travel more, the increased availability of low-cost flights and the rise of the Chinese middle class, which is spending a lot of their money on travel. And so you're seeing some destinations like Venice and Amsterdam and even places like Prague and Barcelona that are getting to a point where tourists are, are really creating a problem. They're driving out locals away from, so that you know if you're a local, you can't even live anywhere near the center. 
they are they're kind of making the destinations almost unenjoyable particularly during high seasons and if you go to some of these places like people say if you go to venice and like you know off season it's actually perfectly wonderful but during those busy months it's, it's really quite a problem and so you're starting to see some destinations that are actually like stopping their tourism campaigns or thinking about like you know should we actually be promoting more tourists to come here because maybe we're not we're at a place where we can't handle it anymore yeah and, I, I could definitely see that and it's a double-edged sword because a lot of places rely heavily on tourism dollars and if it wasn't for tourists coming they would be off the map but also they would lose a ton of money but at the same time it's kind of like too much of a good thing and almost doing too good of a job promoting your city right ends up kind of biting you in the butt yeah, I mean, I think that's right. I think that, you know, I think a part of the problem is is that tourists have this tendency to always go to the same places. And that's that's nothing new, but social media definitely drives that. You'll see it where, you know, a particular place will get hot on social media. Iceland's a perfect example of this. Ten years ago, there's hardly anything on, on in terms of tourism in Iceland. And then they suddenly have this... Um, this big, uh, that volcano issue that they had. And then there's all these beautiful photos of Iceland all over the news. And now it like goes viral and everybody goes to Iceland. And now Iceland's over, over touristed in the span of less than a decade. Yeah, I, I can definitely see that. And the, it just compounds because the more people who go, the more kind of FOMO people who've never been there feel. Uh, and then the more they like feel like, well, I have to go or I feel left out or I'm the only one without a photo at, you know, in, in this cool place or they, you know, like it's a, a lot of it's a, a social status thing too, especially in mainland China yeah. where Chinese people, they f- like, they have, you know, this concept of losing face and like, they feel like if they haven't been to the cool place that everyone else has been, then they're less, almost kind of lesser like status wise than other people. And they're also a little bit afraid of, venturing out to new places completely on their own you know a lot of it's language barrier where they don't speak the language you know they like the package tours they like it kind of being easy and having other people have done it already in guides so i think all of it kind of compounds and then you know obviously the more people go to a place the more flights they become the cheaper the flights become and then the less reason there is not to go there right yeah it's it's definitely true that tourism destinations will receive sort of critical mass of tourism to a certain point. But, you know, I think one other trend among millennials is this sort of idea to be different. And that's something that we try to t- tap into. And so the whole sort of premise of, the, of, of emerging destinations is this idea that, look, tourism is not going anywhere. And those trends that are driving the increase of travel, they're not going to stop. And so, you know, we may have, we may see us, if we're, if we're heading into a global recession, we may see a, a small downtick, but long-term tourism numbers are going to continue to go up. And so we have to think about how we do that sustainably as a world population. And I think a big part of the answer has to be just spreading out because there's actually, in the three years I've been traveling the world, I've seen so many beautiful destinations that are like, wow, this is really incredible. Why aren't, why isn't anyone here? And actually when I first came to Georgia two years ago, that's how I felt about Georgia. And I still do to some degree. And, you know, so I think that if, if people spread out and start, you know, realizing that there's other places to go to, you know, that, that has to be a big part of the solution. I, I definitely agree. And I think that there's plenty of places in the world to go. I mean, even in like certain countries, for example, why is it that when people say they're going to France for a vacation, it's always Paris and it's right. always Eiffel Tower. Yeah, that's right. You know, there's probably so many beautiful places in France, you yeah. know, in, you know, in the South, in the kind of the like mountain regions, people just don't go to it because it's not, it's not this photo opportunity where, right. you know, they have to have a photo with, you know, either the Eiffel Tower in, in, in France or in, in Paris or the, what, what is that uh, new church, that big church in the uh, Barcelona? Notre Dame? No, Notre oh, Dame. Uh, okay. Right. Uh, the Sagrada Familia. Yeah. Um, like that is kind of like the reason to go to Barcelona is yeah. just to take pictures there. And there's so, there's so many amazing places in Spain outside of Barcelona, like way better places, I think too, way yeah. cheaper, way better, but just everyone wants to go to Barcelona. I mean, I think part of it is that that's what people think about. If you're average traveler uh, back home is thinking about traveling and they haven't traveled before, the first things that come to mind are Paris and London and Tokyo and, and those sort of places that are, have been in the pop, popular lexicon forever that you constantly see on social media. And so, you know, what we're trying to do is we're trying to inject other destinations into the conversation. Yeah, I, I like it. And I think that the second tier destinations, second tier cities, 
I, I don't even like that word because it makes it sound like it's lesser or not as mm-hmm. good. But I feel like the second biggest city or the second most touristed city is often way better. Like, for example, Bangkok is probably the most touristed city in Thailand. Right. But Chiang Mai is way better in every way. It's oh, yeah. cheaper. People are nicer. It's nice. You know, like everything about it is better. Uh, Phuket is the most touristed island in, in Thailand. But this, or maybe P- Koh Phi Phi, but the lesser known ones like Koh Lanta or even like Raleigh Beach and, and Krabi are way nicer. Like yeah. they're just better in every way. Yeah. Phuket, Phuket is... Yeah, I was just living in Thailand last last winter and I avoided it like the plague. Oh, for sure. Yeah, so I think, you know, by uh, these emerging places being more popularized, it is a good thing for everyone because it spreads out mm. the tourism dollars for the locals. It spreads out the number of people so places don't get annoyingly over, over-touristed. But it's also just nicer for, you know, like to be in, right? Because right. I would never, ever, ever want to go to places like you know even Athens or what's, what's that really popular island Santorini yeah. during the peak of summer it just would be frustrating and annoying yeah Santorini is nuts um, I actually have an article on my site about why people should skip Santorini and I have this photo where it's like a hundred people jamming together to like get the iconic Santorini photo and you can just see the same photo a hundred times in all of their phones mm. um, and that was sort of my experience there it was you know, just pushing through the crowds. And, you know, even at the, the school there in Santorini, I remember they had signs for tourists saying, don't take photos of the children because this was something they had to do. They had to put up signs everywhere because people were just taking photos of kids playing on a playground. Yeah. And uh, I, so I actually went to Santorini in like April or something last right. year. And I was like, oh, this place is great. Like, there's not that many people. Like, if you're in April, yeah, that's right. I mean, again, it doesn't matter what season you go in, for sure. Yeah, yeah. and I, I think that's another big part of it is if you guys, you know, I mean, I'm not specifically saying to you, the one listening, but just in general for, for travelers, there are ways to enjoy a place that's even a super touristy place. It's just to go in the off season or go like on a time that, you know, people, the kids are in school or people don't have that, that winter break or like the summer break. Yeah, off season's great and you know, accommodation tends to be cheaper as well. Um and there's you know, there's fewer people there. So for sure. So I guess one question would be like, I mean people they can look at us and be like, All right, well you guys are traveling full time. Mm-hmm. Uh you're going to some of these places, you're staying on Airbnbs. Are we pro- pro- part of the problem? Are digital nomads part of the problem? Yeah, I mean, I think it depends on where you're going, right? And, you know, an Airbnb is certainly a, a controversial issue because there are places where, you know, Airbnbs take homes away from locals. On the other hand, they raise the value of, of local homes. And so it depends on who's owning them, right? Because you'll have a lot of these Airbnbs that are owned by these big management companies that own a hundred of them. And maybe they're foreign backed. And so the money's not even going into the local economy. Here in Tbilisi, I'm staying in a unit that a family basically converted out of their own house into their own little Airbnb. And so they own it, just owned by that family, and they're getting all the money um, out of it. And so that's contributing to the local economy. I mean, of course, Airbnb takes its cut as the booking platform. Um, I wish there was a better alternative to Airbnb, but there isn't. And, you know, so I think I think that's definitely true. And I think that there also has to be sort of consideration of where you live. I often will live in further out neighborhoods. You know, the, the neighborhood that we, even you were in right now isn't super touristy. It's not an old town Tbilisi which is the kind of place where you are starting to see a little bit in Tbilisi of, of the Airbnb pushing people out. But, you know, if you're in a neighborhood where it's, it's mostly locals, um, you know, that's, I think that's one way of, of helping contribute to the problem. And overall, I mean, if you talk to Georgians, they very much want digital nomads to come here. They're very, you know, they, they've taken a big hit recently with Russia canceling flights to Georgia, and they're very eager to have the money that nomads inject into the economy. And I think nomads are better tourists than your average tourist because they stay for longer. They spend money at, I think, tends to be more local places. They're going to local cafes, local restaurants, local bars, and tend to live a little bit more like a local. So more of that money is going back in the economy and not to the Hyatts and the Marriott's and the, you know, the big foreign tour companies. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. And I think it was Kristen Wilson, she had an article about if digital nomads are affecting over tourism. And she, she broke it down really good. I think it was a Medium article. And the, the, the big premise of it was, the, the finding of it was, first, there's not that many of us, even though we think there's a lot. You know, there's probably thousands, tens of thousands, maybe 100,000 of us in the world, but we're pretty spread out. 
There's so really very, very insignificant amount of people compared to mass tourism. But second, exactly what you had said is that we live more like locals and we're also like very budget conscious where we won't go and spend a hundred dollars a night on a hotel or on an Airbnb for one night. We'll get a place for like, let's say a month at a time. That's maybe a little bit more than what a local would pay, but not that much more. Uh, we also kind of like and support, you know, nicer places. So in a sense, we are helping gentrify neighborhoods, but in a sense, we're also helping build up nicer neighborhoods and nicer places to live, supporting, you know, nicer restaurants and, and not like fancy restaurants, but just kind of trendier places, more hipster places, hipster coffee shops, uh, office spaces, th things like that, that overall are probably good for the economy. Yeah, that's right. And look, like I always tell people when, when people talk about the fact that your tourism dollars can, can, if spent in a certain way, contribute to problems, it's like one, be responsible about how you spend your money. And two, realize that if you don't travel, that money's going to get spent somewhere else. And if you're at home and you're spending money um, on buying things, you know, that has a whole wave of, of social problems that comes with it as well. So, you know, any way that you spend your money, whether you're, you know, you're living back in the States and you're just buying things on Amazon every day with what you have, or if you're out traveling, you have to sort of be socially responsible about it. Yeah. Okay. I see that. Um, I also think like, so there was a Wendover Productions, like YouTube video explaining, um, over tourism. And one of the reasons why they say that short term travelers are so bad for cities is because everybody crowds to the same location every day, right? So for example, let's say, here's the difference between uh, a typical kind of quick traveler and a longer term traveler. So let's say we go to a very popular city like, you know, Barcelona, for example. Every single person who goes to Barcelona will go to the, the, the hotspot. I, mm -hmm. I cannot pronounce it for the life of me. Sagrada Familia. Sagrada Familia, yeah. One, like, you know, you just have to go, right? 100% of people are going to go. But you only go once. Nobody goes there, like, you know, every day they're there, right? So if you are a long-term traveler and you're staying for a month or three months, you'll go one time. So you're contributing to one X unit of over tourism there, right? Versus if you are like a normal tourist and you're there for one day or th three days and you're going to go, like, during that, that time you're there... And then the very next day, someone else comes and they replace your hotel room or your Airbnb with the new tourist. Basically, in like in that same month, you have 30 people visiting that same spot, which leads to the over tourism, the congestion, the traffic, the annoyance, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. So if everybody just traveled slower and spent more time in each city or each country, like there just wouldn't be that that congestion, especially at the hotspots. Yeah, I mean, I forgot that I used to be like this back when I was working a corporate job where, you know, especially Americans only get a limited amount of vacation. And so we tend to just like rush through destinations. I used to do two week vacations where I would hit five countries in two weeks. Wow. Which is crazy. Yeah. And but people that, do that. Yeah, yeah, totally. And, um, and like a typical, like it would be not, un, it would not be weird for an American to say, okay, I'm going to Europe this summer. I have two week vacation, which means I have... 10, 10 days in Europe. <laughs> so I'm going to go uh, to, I'm going to fly to Amsterdam. And then the next day, I'm going to go to Paris. Yep. The next day, I'm going to go to Barcelona. The next day, I'm going to Rome. Then Venice. You know, and, yeah, you yeah. will get people who will spend one or two nights in, in, in these places. And, you know, I mean, yeah, slower travel for sure helps. It's definitely also more environmentally friendly because you have less transportation mm -hmm. costs involved. I mean, there, there's a whole suite of solutions that have to be a part of addressing over tourism. I'm focusing on just, you know, laser focused on the one because I can't solve everything. And, you know, and I think it's fun. And I, I think generally speaking, I, I just think that there's so many more beautiful places in the world than people realize, um, just completely undiscovered or not undiscovered. And I actually don't like that word because it has like colonial implications to it, but places that aren't in the popular sort of imagination right now. And, and it's not just, it's not just the ones that we've sort of heard about since our childhood. And I would never tell somebody like, don't go to London or New York or I Paris. I tell them all the time. Like, I tell yeah. them all the time, like, especially like, and you know, like even my, my parents, like my mom's like, oh, I really want to go to Paris and I really want to go to, you know, Rome, I really want to go to, you know, and she's just naming the places that she heard about like 20 years ago where right. all her friends have been to. And I'm like, no, I don't want to go. Like we can go to Europe where I'll, I'll happily even pay for your trip to go to Europe, but let's go to, 
you know, X, Y, Z place, right. you know, and she's like, no, I don't even want to, I don't want to go. I never heard of it. None of my friends have heard of it. So there's no bragging rights if I go. And I was just say to her then, I'm like, all right, well, I'd rather not go. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, look, I think if, if it's, it's hard to sometimes forget what it's like to not have traveled when you've traveled as extensively as, as we have. And as a lot of nomads that have out there, when it, when it is your life, it's hard to forget what it's like to go to your first country. And for me, that was something I did as a child. So, you know, I, I, it's, if that's what gets somebody traveling, like, that's great. But I think it, soon thereafter, we have to start sort of encouraging people to, to think of other destinations and not to just, you know, always be going to sort of the top hits. And the bigger that we can make the menu, the more items that we present to people to order off of for their travel, I think that's going to make it easier for people to spread out. I think you're a lot nicer guy than I am. <laughs> I think I'm all about travel shaming people. <laughs> just like they're like when they take that same selfie or that same photo at these kind of you know at like these overcrowded places. All right. Like I'm just like no. Like I'm not going to congratulate you for making it to you know Segura Familia or the Eiffel Tower or whatever. Yeah. Like it's a, like. And the, here's the problem is everyone's like, well, I'm just going to go once. Well, yeah, of course, right? Like no one's going to go more than once. But it's the same problem with like people saying, all right, well, I'm only going to have, I'm only getting married once. I'm only going to buy a blood diamond once or I'm only going to have shark fin soup once. Right. Like, and, and like, yeah, it's true. Everyone's just doing it once in their life. But if every single person in the world, there's billions of us, right? Yeah. Like that, that's what kind of ruins everything. Right? I almost, I almost think that especially with the millennials that like being different, being you know, and have, being, having this different opportunity, I think it's really nice to be able to encourage people to say, you know what, you don't need to go that w once, just say you've been there and you didn't like it. We can just skip it and just go to these other cool places and completely skip that over towards the place in the first place. Yeah, totally. totally. Yeah. So what, what are some of the places that won last year? Uh, so we have a, a long list every year. I think it's about 40 destinations. We do a list by continent. Um, some of our big winners, because we do an overall sort of winners, uh, included this town called Valladolid in Mexico, which I just, is one of my favorite towns. It's, it's somewhere between a town and a city. It's about 100,000 people. It's interesting because it's this small Mexican town in the middle of the jungle, not that far. It's about 45 minutes from Chichen Itza, which is one of the new seven wonders of the world. Well, and it's only an hour from Tulum, which is one of the boomingest de you know, tourism destinations in Mexico and really the whole world at this point. And yet the vast majority of people who go to those destinations either don't know anything about Valladolid or if they do, they just stop over briefly for a restroom break on their way to Chichen Itza. And you can go to this like this, this really incredible old colonial town that's just filled with uh, cenotes, uh, which I know you, you know what cenotes are, but for uh, any listeners who don't know, cenotes are, I call them dinosaur swimming holes <laughs> because they were... Uh, because they were actually formed in part by the asteroid that killed the dinosaurs mm. um, that hit uh, in the Yucatan Peninsula and, um, and contributed to these sort of breaks in the limestone bedrock that fill up with spring water. And you can go swimming in them. So it's, it's very sort of Indiana Jones-esque uh, when you're going in these cenotes. And they just have some like stunning ones there, including like in the middle of the town. Like you just walk a few blocks away from the main square and you can go to some of these lots of really traditional cultural performances. And you can walk down the streets and not see a, another tourist at all. And it's, it's just a wonderful town that I think is true Mexico. And in the Yucatan, which is a destination that's so filled with sort of beach tourism and whatnot, it's really refreshing to see that. And so that town was great. They won. I traveled there to present them with the award um, in March. And they... Uh, showed up and they they were like, do you want to have dinner with the mayor to, to present the award? Wow. I was like, sure. And I show up and they have a 150 person banquet for me. Wow. Um, they brought out like the town's like dancers. They had the press there and I was just like super caught off guard. I had like, they asked me to say a few words, but nobody there spoke English. So I did the whole thing in Spanish. What, what did he um, say? And in managed Spanish? to, you know, I, I, I sort of explained the idea behind the words and I just told them why I thought Valladolid was such a wonderful place. And I think it was really interesting because we had so many locals that come up to me uh, when I go to Valladolid now um, and are just, you know, so eager to have people come visit their town because they really love it and they want to share it with the world. And I think that's what's really cool about a lot of these destinations that we have is, is that the locals are eager for tourism to come, which is the very opposite of what you see in places like Venice and Amsterdam. That's okay. So I think you just hit the nail on the head. And this is, I think, the most exciting part, but also the solution is it's simple. Go where you are welcome. Go where you're wanted. Go where you are. People want you to be there. And this is what I like about 
Tbilisi, Georgia right now is locals want us here. They need us here. They need the tourism dollars. They need the, you know, the just people coming. Like they want to be on the map. And maybe in five years or three years or 10 years, they won't want us here anymore. And instead of just saying, well, too bad, I need that photo of, you know, what, like whatever, whatever that iconic Tbilisi thing is because everyone else has been there. We can just be like, all right, well, I missed the boat. Oh, you know, oh well, what's the, what's the next place right now that where they want us there and they need us there and just go there instead? Yeah, I think local community say has to be a big part of it. And that's actually one thing we do with the awards because we put out the list that all the bloggers pick and we give it a month and we basically have an online poll where we allow uh, people to come in and to vote for their favorite among the winners. And it's interesting because what ends up happening is, is that in certain of those destinations, it will go like hyper viral. Like we had like 133,000 shares on Facebook last year, but it was largely concentrated in certain destinations, Vidali being one of them. And, you know, I, sometimes people say that and they say, oh, it's just an online poll and it's just, it's just showing, it's not, you know, it's not travelers voting on this, it's the locals voting on it. And I'm like, well, that's, that's exactly the point. The ones who are, who are eager enough that it goes viral in their place because they're like, oh, look, tourists are interested in coming here, let's make them come here, it says a lot about that place. And I think that should be a good barometer of whether or not that's a place that you wanna travel. And so finding ways to engage local communities in those decisions about how tourism impacts them is definitely important. You know, it can be hard when you're researching um, destinations to know what the locals think of everything. And even when you're in a town sometimes, you know, the, the folks that you're most likely to talk to are gonna be people who are directly employed by the tourism industry. So of course they're gonna tell you that they want more tourists. And so we have to find ways of getting a broader sort of sense of the community pulse. I like that a lot. And I just thought of a, another example is Lisbon, Portugal. If you talk to locals, it depends on how old they are and how long they live there. Because the people that have lived there you know, for 20 or more years, they will say, thank God for tourism because Lisbon was a piece of crap 10 years ago or 20 years ago. Right. And if it wasn't for tourism, it would still be a piece of crap. But now it's amazing. It's hustling. It's bustling. However, it's also now getting over-touristed. You know, just in the fat last couple of years that I, when I first went versus this year, I realized, I was like, man, prices have gone up so much. Locals are, you know, getting kind of outpriced. And now they're like, okay, guys, you know, thanks, you know, obrigado for like, you know, five years ago, but like, just please stop. <laughs> like, please stop coming now. Yeah, I mean, you know, and a lot of this has to be on local destinations and the way that they manage their incoming tourism. And that's a difficult conversation to have. Um, but you see some places, I actually think from from like a, 30,000 foot view that Georgia's being fairly responsible in the way that they're managing the fact that it's Georgia's kind of on the upswing uh, as a tourist destination. You see them doing a lot of work here in Tbilisi to change the traffic structure because right now you have this big hub in Rusta Valley that everybody gets routed through, which is really smart because if, if this place does pop as a tourist destination, that's going to be a big problem. And then you go out to places like the mountains of Svaneti, which is my favorite part of Georgia, and I sometimes even hesitate to tell people about it because this is like ancient sort of rural villages locked up in the mountains and it's like beautiful but there's only you know 800 people living in a village so if a bunch of tourists come they're going to ruin the whole thing and you know it is tourism is starting to pick up there but you know i asked around and i was told that all but one of the hotels in svaneti like the local guest houses is owned by svan families and even that one is jointly owned by a canadian and by a local and so there's a lot of effort in trying to keep sort of you know foreign investment out and trying to make manage it as much locally as they can here. And so, you know, Georgia has a lot of political problems, but I'm, you know, cautiously optimistic that hopefully it will be an example of a country that's actually able to sustainably manage an increase in tourism. Yeah, I think that's really smart. I think it's, a lot of it's kind of just thinking like long term, like what would happen if we meet our goals? Right. And I know in places like let's say Grand Canary in the south in, in um, Mas Masla Pomoas, they basically just sold all that land to international hotel chains and they got like a one-time big payment, but I think now they probably don't get much from them anymore. And, or, you know, countries that will just be like, all right, well, if you want to build the airport, we want to build the bridge and, you know, like, thank you because we need it now. But they're not thinking, well, three years, five years from now, are we going to be like, well, like, do we still want you to be control and getting all the profits from it? So I think a lot of it is just thinking, thinking ahead. And I think 
the problem is people want like that short term solution. Yeah. And then, you know, you do see a lot of foreign investment here in Tbilisi. There's big concerns about the Russians and the Saudis buying up too much property here um, in the city itself. And, you know, if you travel a lot of destinations on the African continent, particularly East Africa, there's so much like everything's owned by some sort of Chinese company. Yeah. Um, everything. And it's even to the point where Kenya's switching over their language instruction from English to Chinese at the primary wow. school level because that is how much the, these sort of these foreign countries are coming in and, and buying up stuff. And yeah, there has to be some thought to sort of what the, the long term consequences all are as this. And so, you know, everything it's as travelers, I think we have a responsibility to think about where we spend our money. But there's also definitely a lot of it has to come from the local governmental level. Yeah, I, I, I like that we think about it because it feels like, you know, I mean, and we are, like, we are directly affecting things, you know, on a personal level. But at the end of the day, what we do is still produce small percentage, especially individually. It really is, it comes down to the, the governance behind it and, and, like, policies. Like, if they wanted to get rid of all the cruise ship passengers, because they are annoying as crap, when they come into a city for four hours, they just, like, you know, just crowd the streets, go to like the same touristy shops and just like annoy the crap out of everyone. You know, they just crowd that one hotspot and they leave. So they really don't spend that much money because they, a lot of them don't even eat in the city. They just like, or they, if they do, they eat like, you know, um, at like the super touristy chain. So they're not really bringing any money in. They're kind of just coming. If a local city was like, all right, well, let's control this. There's like they could just you know have a crazy high tax or something and say if you're not spending the night here if you're not spending at least you know three nights in in our city the tax is this much to come in yeah cruise ships are definitely a problem I mean Santorini is another destination we talked about and the difference between Santorini on a day when there's some cruise ships in town and when there's not is very significant as well and so I think that can can change your perception of a place and there's a lot of discussion around on, around how you deal with with cruise ships and a, but definitely a part of the problem is, is that cruises are so cheap. Um, and so I, you know, I don't think it's at all unreasonable to say, okay, we're going to slap a, you know, a fifty dollar a head tax if you want to dock in our port. If you really want to put Venice on your itinerary, you're going to have to raise your prices. Yeah. Well, actually, I think like what they should do is say, like, go ahead and, and not charge the actual cruise ship because they'll just choose a different destination. But what they should do is say, you can dock in our port, but if you actually like, the, it's up to the individual passenger. If they want to stay on board. You know, they don't, there's no tax. But if they want to come into the city, like for those couple of hours, mm -hmm. then you have a fifty dollar per person tax. Yeah, I mean, basically, what you're talking about is a congestion tax, right? Which have been used by cities like London for a while for traffic management on cars. And so it'd be interesting to apply. I don't know of any major cities. I know it's been talked about a lot, but I don't know of any major cities that have applied it to actual tourists. But you do see it a lot in places like um, you, you'll see where you'll be charged to go to like natural. Uh, national parks, like sort of more environmental places. And I think that's perfectly reasonable to, to contribute something, especially if you're putting the money into projects that help make the place, you know, sustainable. I, I definitely agree. Uh, when I first saw that Copenhagen started charging a, a entrance fee for like ferry passengers, at first I was kind of annoyed. I was like, what is this going to? But what I realized it's because so many people are now staying on Koh Samui, the island next to it, uh, where it's a little bit cheap, where it's cheaper, and then they just take the boat over just for the party, and then they go home. You know, so they basically come, they like, you know, drink a bunch of beers, throw them on the ground, buckets on the ground. So there's a bunch of tr like trash and litter, and then they leave. So they're not really contributing to that island's economy. I think the problem right now is like the amount they charge just isn't enough for, to dissuade people, and and people don't don't even know about the the, the tax, so. I, I think what they need to do is charge like an amount where it's not unreasonable, but it's high enough where people are like, well, maybe I should just stay on this island instead. Yeah. But what's nice is I've seen where that money goes. It actually goes to this like 50 person cleanup crew from the beach the very next morning. So like literally hours after the party is ends, the beach is spotless again. Right. Yeah, that is true. I've been to the full moon party twice, and you're right. It is impressive how, how they managed to clean it up. And for sure, that has to be part. I mean, the cruise ships, you know, if your cruise ship docks in Venice, you can go to other places, and you can encourage, encourage travelers to spread out in that way as well. Yeah, I think there has to be a whole suite of, of solutions to the problem. It's good that it's getting attention, though. I think this year, 2019, has been the first year that in popular media, we've started to see sort of a a persistent wave of articles that talk about the problem of over tourism. So certainly that dialogue is the first step. Yeah, I definitely like it.
This is, this is Johnny FD, and this week I want to tell you about a really cool money saving travel hack with Approvo. As you guys are probably aware, I stay at a lot of Airbnbs, but the biggest problem with Airbnb is the refund policies and cancellation policies are terrible. The best thing about booking with hotels is how amazing their cancellation policies are. With most hotels, you can get back 100% of your money even if you cancel a day or two before. So Provo takes advantage of this really amazing cancellation policy by tracking the prices to see if they go down between the time you had booked your hotel and the time you're actually staying. All you have to do is forward any hotel confirmation that you have to nomad at provo.net. That's nomad at provo.net. And that's it. You don't have to make an account. You don't have to sign up or anything. They will let you know if that price ends up dropping before your stay, and they'll show you how much you can save. If you want, then you can create an account for them to automatically pull them out of your, your inbox, but you can just do it manually. You never even need to make an account if you don't want to. It's a great service. I've tried it myself. Just go through your Gmail or your email inbox right now and just start forwarding all your hotel confirmations that are upcoming to nomadapprovo.net. I had honestly never heard of Valladolid, Mexico. Valladolid, yeah, and you're headed there. I'm you're heading headed, very I, close. Yeah, so now instead of just staying in Playa del Carmen or yeah. Tulum, I'm gonna make. I'm definitely gonna make a trip down there. Yeah, you should definitely. You should definitely go there. It's amazing. Yeah. I will um, go to this restaurant called Casa Conado. It's unbelievable um, local, like Mayan fusion cuisine. And I'm not a foodie, um, okay. so you'll really enjoy it. I'll, I'll show them a, a photo of me and you together <laughs> and be you like, go. I know this guy. Yeah. <laughs> Get some VIP treatment. <laughs> yeah, well, we shot a video there, so the owner should remember me. Okay, cool. I like it. Uh, so what were some of the other like, emerging destinations? Sure. So, um, you know, other, other big winners that we had included um, Serbia, um, Tasmania won uh, in Oceania. And Tasmania is another example of just a, an incredible place that so many people go to Australia. They just do the east coast of Australia, typically. Or maybe Sydney, Sydney and Melbourne, Melbourne. And then they sort of go up Byron Bay, the Gold Coast. And Tasmanian's unbelievable. Like, I mean, it's so beautiful. It's so different than the rest of Australia. The rest of Australia tends to be sort of like flat, arid, beautiful beaches, a lot to see for sure um, on the mainland. But then Tasmania, it's this tiny little microcosm of sort of everything. You've, you, you can drive from a rainforest to like the, a sort of barren mountaintop and then to like a beautiful beach in like the span of a few hours. And Tasmania doesn't get anywhere near the same number of tourists as, as other parts of the country, but I think it's by far the most beautiful part of what I've seen anyway of Australia. I like that. And they have the Tasmanian devils. Yeah, that's right. That's Badass. true. Oh, it's hard to, you see signs for them, like crossing signs for them on the road, like really, but I've never, I've never actually seen one. Yeah. Uh, I, I think I've only seen one out because like, it was a zoo or something and we were, they were fighting or having sex maybe. <laughs> they were the loudest screaming things I've ever heard in my life. Yeah. I think that's why they call them the, the yeah. like de devils. They, it sounded like the devil was coming. Well, they have that little the Looney Tunes character who yeah. you know, uh, who's based off of them. So yeah, Tasmania is beautiful. Um, Serbia was an, our our big winner in Europe, and Serbia and really I think most of the Balkans outside of Croatia, which has gotten a wave of tourism lately, um, are places that could use a lot more tourists. Tourists, you know, because of the the recent sort of political strife in that part of the world. It's only recent, recently that it's, they've sort of started to open up and that the tourism industry started to increase. But Serbia is just beautiful. I mean, they have a, a gorgeous countryside and then Belgrade, which is a very vibrant sort of grungy hipster type city um, with like unbelievable nightlife. They have all these clubs that are strung up along the river in the center of town. And, um, and Serbia is a place that I think is 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 should be on people's travel lists uh, for sure. Uh, Kiev was another one of our winners in Europe, where we just uh, where I met you and where we spent yeah. um, a part of the summer. And I think you know Kiev's a city. I always tell people um, when I was going there, people were like, "Why are you going to Kiev?" And I said, "You know, it's bigger than Paris. It's it's a very large city, one of the biggest cities in Europe, and it's a lot more cosmopolitan than I think people expect. There's there's many different sides of of Kiev, and you can kind of find anything that you're into from fancy restaurants to salsa dancing to nightlife to you know and um and these sort of places i think are are all wonderful sort of places to travel to and that a lot of people don't sort of think about but once you go you you realize you're like oh wow this is great and then it's so great to experience a place like Kiev where you're not constantly 
feeling like you're the um, you know you're surrounded only by other tourists and you actually get a chance to interact with the locals. Yeah, definitely. And actually, it's funny that uh, Serbia was on my. I, I think I, I actually before I met you, I looked on Google Maps, and I was like, I wonder what the next country is that I would like go to if all these other countries got over touristed. And I don't know. I don't know why. Like Serbia just kind of popped up, and I was like, like oh, I never really thought about this place. Like maybe that might be good. And you had just confirmed like that is a, yeah, a Serbia is great. You know, I mean, one challenge with some of these places, and one one thing they tend to have in common is the lack of direct flight connections. Mm, so yeah. it's definitely something that keeps Tbilisi down. Um, and it's a challenge, you know, for Belgrade, for example, and everywhere in the Balkans is, is that it does require that extra connection in order to get there. And so it does sort of act as a filter, I think, to keep some of the masses out. But it, you know, if you're looking at a flight and you, and you see, you know, a, a flight that gets you directly to, to Frankfurt or something, you say, I'll just go to Germany. And then it's a question of whether you want to take that extra connection to go somewhere else. A lot of people won't do it yeah. um, or they'll do one stop at most. And sometimes it takes two, especially if you're coming from the States to get to these destinations. Um, if you're listening and, and that's you and you find yourself in that situation, like I know vacation time is valuable, but sometimes making that extra effort and spending a few extra hours on another short hop can make it t make all the difference in the world. Yeah. The, the difference between so who just goes to Bangkok and the person who is, kind of skips Bangkok, you know, or like this is why I always tell people like if, if it's your first time in, in, in Thailand and you're, you're, you're a tourist, let's say you have two weeks, like skip Bangkok to the end. Like it, I know you have to see it, right? Even though you really don't just make that extra trip and say, all right, when I get in, I'm going to go directly down to one of the islands and, and probably not Phuket or at least not like Patong. You know, if you're going to go to Phuket, there's really beautiful places in the North Phuket and the very South Phuket. Uh, or go to make the extra little trip and go to Koh Lanta or some of these other places. Yeah, there's a huge number of tourists who go to Thailand and they just go to Bangkok, Pattaya, and like Phuket. Yeah. And those are like the worst places. The worst in places. The worst. Actually, what drives me crazy is my mom, when I first told her I was gonna go to Thailand, she was like, no. And I was like, well, why? Yeah. And she's like, I've been there and it's, it's terrible. And turns out she was on a package tour that took her to Bangkok and Pattaya. Right. And it's just because it's the closest beach where they can drive to. And that's all, you know, it's also the, the worst place. And then when they came to visit me, I insisted on meeting in Colanta. And at first they were so tired from that flight and then another flight and then this long ferry ride. By the time they got to Colanta, they were exhausted, but it was so nice and it was so beautiful. And I think it's, it's worth that extra, extra hop because when pe most people won't do it. And that barrier, that extra hour of travel, that extra flight or that extra, extra bus is the difference between being somewhere that is over touristed, busy, expensive, annoying to everyone. I mean, if you're annoyed, if you're annoyed, you're also annoying other people. Just remember that. Yeah. It's a, that's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, verse, and also that's why I like Chiang Mai so much is because it's just a little bit harder to get to. And a lot of people just don't do it. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm actually taking a look at a map right now to even see where Serbia is. Cause <laughs> right. I like, honestly, I didn't even know. Somebody actually had mentioned to me just today because I had mentioned that Georgia has the best visa in the world, at least from from what I had found, the one year visa on arrival. Mm -hmm. And someone mentioned today that Albania actually has the same visa. Yeah, Albania is is, is another country that's um, that's definitely making efforts to promote people to come. I know, and I I haven't actually been to Albania. I've heard Tirana is a up and coming digital nomad uh, city down the line. I don't know. I, I I can I can see. I mean, with the visa policy, yeah, right. Um, and also, it's right next to Greece, which kind of makes it easy. I also, and, it's supposed to be even more affordable than Georgia. Wow. Yeah. Which is Georgia is for anyone listening is. I mean, it's we're it's probably so what, like Thailand levels of prices here. So, something around there. On uh, johnnyfd.com, I just wrote that big, massive blog post about Tbilisi, Georgia. Right. And a section of it was cost comparison. And I had chose to run numbers against Bangkok because the you know the, the big capital city in Asia or right. in Thailand versus the big capital city here, yeah. and I was shocked that 
everything except for two categories was actually cheaper in Tbilisi yeah. than it is in Bangkok. Yeah, I believe it. It's, it feels right to me for sure. Yeah. It's, Georgia is about as cheap as it comes in Europe, but they, they say that Albania is even more. Or, and I, don't, I try to use the word affordable because I don't, sometimes you'll, you'll use the word cheap to local and be like, my country is not cheap. Yeah. And it's like, okay, it's not meant as a normative judgment, but a more affordable destination. Uh, yeah. Even. Or well-priced yeah. or like, yeah, I, I like these terms. And so I, I also like that. I don't think it's good when travelers or especially digi- digital nomads are cheap, right? As in like trying to bargain down things below they sh- what they should be and, or like, you know, just doing the cheapest option all the time. Cause I think we can afford to have slightly nicer things. Uh, but at the same time, like I don't like getting ripped off. Like that's why I hate going to places where you have to argue about prices or the prices aren't label and you have to like negotiate. Have all you the been time. to Egypt? I would never go to Egypt because of that. It yeah. just like it would drive me nuts, and I don't want to support cultures like that. And that's why I don't go to Egypt is because I don't want to to vote with my tourism dollars and say it's okay for you to to treat people like this and be rude and you know, and hassle people. Yeah. I mean, look, I went to Egypt and you definitely experienced that. It's a hard thing, especially cause I went right after, you know, Egypt used to be, I think like fifth in the world, somewhere around there in terms of tourism overall. And then, you know, they had a lot of political strife around the time of the Arab spring. And ever since then, it's just taken a huge hit. And then they had, I went a month after they had a bombing at the pyramids and at that point, there was there was just no tourists at all. Like no, they they shut down all the flights from um, from Europe into into Cairo. And so when I went, it was like just me, which meant that all these people who were, who were reliant on that as their income source were then left uh, to try to fight for the handful of remaining tourists there. And it meant that you couldn't walk anywhere without. I mean, you had to like have your hand over your wallet the entire time you were walking around because people were just constantly coming up to you, and you couldn't even. You couldn't even, you know, speak to each of them at a time. At the same time, you know, I do feel somewhat um, bad because it's, it is definitely a, uh, some of that's a product of economic circumstance and some of the struggles that some of these places have had. Um, so, you know, that can be a challenge as well. Egypt's, Egypt's a, you know, it's definitely a difficult place to get to, but, um, but the pyramids are world-class, really genuinely world-class attraction. And there's like quite a few, I think the only other one I'd really say that about is the Great Wall of China. The, the one story that I heard that makes made me just never want to go to Egypt was I had a friend who went there and he said he went on this tour of the pyramids, right? Mm-hmm. And he's just thinking, oh my God, this is amazing. The history behind this, the culture behind this. And he's just, he's admiring, like a, and he's admiring uh, something inside the pyramid. And his guide, his, you know, local Egyptian guy, starts chipping away with a knife to like take off a piece of it to sell it to him. <laughs> that's yeah that's not good at all and he's like yeah. he gets he's so angry he's like are you fucking serious like you're like you know how much history is behind like behind this and, and if every single person if every you know guy did this with every tourist like you would just ruin like what you guys have and you guys don't appreciate what you have and it, that's that short term thinking you know and I, I do feel bad when people ha- you know countries have bad economic situations because it's not, usually not their fault but I do think that the mentality behind like this super short term thinking and ripping off tours means that when things are going well, yeah, you can, you know, you can kind of steal a bit more money from tours, but as soon as something bad happens, you get no sympathy. That's an interesting perspective for sure. You know, I think, um, you know, I think it is, it is, it's definitely, it's definitely the fact that some of these places, you know, you can become too reliant on tourism and then it becomes a problem uh, if it does wash away. And so yeah. that's, you know, that's another, another end of it. I'm trying to think of a few other, other destinations like that. There've been quite a few that were hit pretty hard in the Middle East. So, uh, Sri Lanka just this year. Yeah, that's right. It's, you know, because of the kind of like religious bombings. They One of our winners yeah. of our Asia award, by the way, the, wow. the winner of the big, uh, the, the reader awards overall in Asia. And yeah, they had the, the bombings, um, that hit right as they were just on the upswing. Yeah. And so they won our award and they won another award that's a little smaller than the emerging destination awards called lonely planets, top travel destination <laughs> for the year. Yeah. Um, and, um, and so those, you know, that was a big kind of a that big accomplishment a big for that, them. Yeah. And, but I, and I feel, and but here's the thing is, because Sri Lankans are so nice and they're such genuine people and I felt very like welcome there and appreciated there. Nobody tried to rip me off and it was just such a good feeling place. 
I have so much sympathy for them that not only am I going back, but also I'm encouraging everyone to go back. Yeah. Versus if I was there and, you know, every day when people were hassling me and just like tre- looking at me like a open wallet or like ATM and not appreciating like, you know, us as tourists being there, I would say, well, you know, screw them. We'll go somewhere else. You know, I think one thing, another th- interesting thing about the response to Sri Lanka, I think it, it was unfortunate the extent to which after these bombings, which are tragic events, but the Western media sort of responds by assuming that the entire country is completely like, you can't touch it. It's all just a big ticking time bomb. And we don't do that when we have major terrorist events in white Western destinations. You know, there was a shooting that shot up the strip in Las Vegas, and yet people still go to Vegas. There was a bombing, er, bombing, uh, a a nightclub attack in Orlando. People still go there. People still go to New York. They still go to Paris, Madrid, London. You know, all of these places that have had even bigger terrorist attacks than what we saw in Sri Lanka, yet somehow when it happens in a country where the people have a different skin color, um, our response to it is it tends to be different and and suddenly tourism just dries up to those places. And I think we have a sort of a special responsibility to step back and, and, and think critically about, you know, b- these events do happen, but it's a part of a risk of going everywhere. And Or even staying home. And not yeah, that's right. Everywhere. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Like, um, I, I firmly believe I am safer living the life I live now than if I had just stayed in California, one of the nicest places in the world. Yeah, I mean, we're certainly around a lot fewer guns than I was back home. I mean, it was not, it's not unusual in the States to walk into a bar and at any given point there can be 20 people with a gun holstered and all it takes is one fight for something to, you know, to go bad. One and, crazy person to yeah. s- like some crackhead to rob yeah, you or stab absolutely. you. Like, and, you know, and we have, and, and that's, it's very few places in the world that have that kind of access to these deadly weapons that we have in the United States. So when people are always worried about me being abroad, I'm like, you're the one hanging around all the guns, you know? Um, yeah. But, I don't know, but also like, like nobody, nobody wants to attack Georgia. Right? Like just like, well, other than Russia, which yeah. is currently but occupying that's, Georgia. That's not really gonna but, happen. Yeah. But like Tbilisi actually is so safe. Like it's yeah, that's crazy true. safe. Yeah, you're right. In terms of like, I mean, I think, you know, in terms of in terms of terrorist attacks, there's not um, th- there's probably knock on wood, there's no reason for that to occur here. But even like uh, street crime, so uh, I couldn't lock this. So, if for the, for those not watching the video, I live on the first floor kind of loft, and it it's basically huge windows facing the street where you can just walk by and you can if you wanted to you could just hop through the window, and one of the lock windows wasn't locking. So I messaged my Airbnb host saying, hey, I can't lock the window. Like, can you please come fix it? And he said, oh, I can come tomorrow, but uh, don't worry. Like, you're in Tbilisi. Nobody will break in. Yeah, no, there's, there's, I don't, I I would be shocked if that were to happen here. You know, I mean, I think you, you, the worst you would possibly have is the possibility of some petty crime if you're in Old Town. And even then, I think pickpockets or something. And even then, I, that's, that's not nearly I haven't as common heard of, as it is. I like haven't even heard of any pickpockets here. Like, no. in every city I normally go to, like, especially the big ones, right? Like Rome, Barcelona, yeah. you will get pickpocketed. Well, somebody yeah. will try. Yeah. But here, it's like, nope, everything's good. Yeah, Nathan, who you had on uh, Foodie Flashbacker, he got, about a, two months ago, got... Um, pickpocketed in Bologna in Italy oh, that sucks. somebody just reached into the back of his backpack and, and took everything out so. man and Bologna is not even that popular of a no. like tourist destination in Italy yeah. it's much it's worse than the rest of Italy yeah. and you know that's another reason why it's not good to go to over touristy places is because it becomes a full time job for criminals to pickpocket and you know rob people or ATM skimmers and scammers to, to come in you know that's why if you go to like Bali, if you go to places like in Italy or in Paris, your chances of having your ATM card cloned, uh, you know, or getting robbed or getting pickpocketed are so much higher than if you go to some random small town or even some small untouristed city, you know, even a big city like Kiev where there's not that many tours because there's just like not enough people to rob or it, like for it to become a full-time job for someone. Yeah, you're right. I mean, it's definitely true that the presence of scammers and, and sort of petty thieves is one barometer of when a place is sort of starting to peak out in terms of over-tourism. Yeah. So I like it. So I, I want to kind of get into the kind of business behind all this. Sure. I think it's really cool that you're yeah. putting it out there. I think it's one of those things that is helping society in general by helping, helping small places, especially places that actually want 
towards tourism. And I think that's super smart from your point of view, from your side, because most travel bloggers don't make any money. It's definitely true of a, a wide, you'd be surprised that there's a handful that can make quite a bit, but it's definitely a, a curve where a, there's a good chunk of what I sort of would call amateur travel bloggers out there. Yeah. yeah. Or just like crappy ones. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure there's like so many travel bloggers that have, let's say even a big following on Instagram, you know, thousands of followers, you know, or they have a really cool looking, you know, blog or website, but and maybe they get some free trips once in a while, free hotel rooms once in a while for writing about them. So it looks like they're successful, but they're not actually making you know cash money. Like they're not even making a thousand dollars a month to support themselves. Yeah, I mean, there's a big. I mean, there's this like whole industry uh, around travel bloggers encouraging other travel travelers to start travel blogs, and so you get so many people that kind of have like a, a part time travel blog, and there's nothing wrong with that, you know. But on the other hand, um, that does sort of lead that that there is a certain reputation in the industry. I try to talk about Travel Lemming as a travel media site and not as a travel blog because that's where I see it going. The Emerging Destination Awards are our first big attempt at this, but I actually plan to eventually get in the proper news publishing business and to, you know, I've looked at trying to hire statisticians so we can start doing some more like uh, quantitative work, talking about over tourism and talking about tourism to these destinations and putting out like reports of statistics and stuff like that with some numbers behind them. Um, and so that's a big part of the business plan for next year is to start to get more into that, eventually get uh, certified as a publisher on Google News and Apple News. And so, yeah, so I, I, I tend to think of the site not as, a, as my travel blog, although it may have somewhat started like that, but more as a travel media site dedicated to the, to the issues of, of around over tourism. And yeah, we, you know, so the thing about making money from a travel blog is, is that you need a lot of eyeballs in order for you know, in order to really make money. And, you know, you really need to be hitting tens of thousands or, or even hundreds of thousands of viewers a month. And that's a lot. And it really takes a lot of time and a lot of work to get there. So you have a lot of travel bloggers who kind of start and yeah, maybe they get some, some traction on Instagram, but to actually get sustained views requires a lot of work. My whole mechanism of growth is just through search engine optimization other than the awards and the awards sort of go viral and get a lot of press attention. So those two things together have been basically the driver of growth for the site. How long did it take you to start getting a substantial amount of visitors? Um, I mean, I think probably reached, I don't know. I want to say you, you hit like inflection points where it kind of goes up. And with SEO, the first six months, you get essentially nothing. I mean, it's, it's less than a thousand a month. Um, you know, maybe some, your personal contacts off Facebook or something. And then after, after that, you start to see a bit of an uptick. And then by a year, I was at about 10,000 a month and then and then from there, it just started growing like enormously. And now, you know, we regularly will hit closer to 100,000 a month. And during the awards this year, you know, my hope is, is that we'll hit a million. Wow. Uh, during, during, during this year's upcoming awards. What about last year during those awards? Yeah, so um, we had, I think our biggest month during the awards last year was about a quarter million. And so, nice. um, you know, it, it, it goes highly viral on social. And so you get these, this huge flood, flood of traffic. But the thing about social traffic is, is that it's not sustained. Mm -hmm. So a month or two later, it's gone. Um, but you do, if you do it right, and we try to do it right, you try to capture some of those, some of those, um, some of those visitors as social followers, as email list subscribers, as as part of your overall website ecosystem, and convert them into sort of more long term readers. And then you use that, and you use the um, the attention from it to to continue to build. And then through all of this, we sort of have. We have guides to a lot of the places that we write about that will come up on Google and then people find you. That's, that's the main mechanism of sort of sustained readership on the blog is SEO. I like it. That's a very, very yeah. smart breakdown. And you're yeah. absolutely right. And that's a big tip for everyone listening is social media traffic is just that top level first hit. If you don't get them to subscribe to your email list or at least follow you somewhere, bookmark you or something, you know, download something, they're, they're going to be gone. They're going to be gone within days, months. Like it's probably a one-time visitor. So you have to, you have to own that reader. Yeah. I always tell people it's interesting because you know, your average traveler when they're in a country will be looking for restaurants or things to do or where to go. And in a given day, I'll be traveling with friends and I'll see them go on and read 
you know, six or seven different blog posts from different travel bloggers. And then you'll sit them down and you'll be talking about my non-travel blogger friends. And I'll just say, you know, how many travel bloggers can you name? And usually it's either zero or if they do, it's like one or two, like nomadic matter, the blonde abroad, the really big ones. And that's it. And, you know, because they don't, they're going to these websites, but the websites aren't necessarily maintaining any sort of brand association um, with your readers. And so once you get people on your, on your site, it's, you know, it's definitely a big part of that is trying to keep as many of them as you can. And most of them you're going to lose. Um, but the more, the more that you can retain, that's, that's important for your engine of growth. I like it. And then how, like, so when you first started, you know, as a s- slow ramp up here to start make you know, start getting visitors, when did like money start coming in? Um, so, you know, I think travel blogging is not my only job and I've done a bunch of different things as a digital nomad over the last three years. So it started as a part-time thing for me. And even today it is still one of, I have two full-time jobs these days. Um, so I was doing a lot of freelance work when I was first started traveling and using that to sort of sustain myself. And then as the travel blog has ramped up in terms of its income, I have reduced my time on the freelance. You know, the thing about freelance work is, is that it makes it you know, it does, it does distract from investing in your business. So at some point I sort of had to make the choice this year. Okay. Now the blog's making three, four, five K a month, depending on the month. Let me just like focus on it and try to really build that and invest in the business as opposed to, you know, spending so much time just trying to make money for freelance work, but that doesn't really build any equity value. And so in terms of the, the growth of it, you know, I think your first year it was, I, I had, gotten some advice that I actually think in retrospect was, was fairly good advice, which was not to monetize too early. And so pretty early on, my blog had no real monetization to it. And so it wasn't until about a year in that I started doing affiliates and stuff. And then a little later that we put ads on the site, um, you probably could have made more money had I, had I made an earlier push to it, but I really was focused on growth. I wanted to get to that hundred thousand a month, which I think is about somewhere in the neighborhood of 50 to a hundred thousand a month, which is where we're sitting at an average month now is about where you're talking about being able to make a full-time income off of a travel block in terms of visitors. And that is a lot, a lot of traffic that yeah. you have to really scrape to get it. takes to a get. long time. Yeah. I would say if you're not, if you're not getting even a thousand visitors, don't even bother wasting your time. Oh, yeah. A thousand visitors. It's is, like, it's, you know. it's literally just pennies. Unless so you have like, something that's like hyper niche and like, yeah. you know, really like, you know, jet, you know, private jets or something, okay. you know? Yeah. Um, and I would say about at 10,000, I guess you can do something like basic, like Google AdSense. Oh, not Google AdSense. I would never do that. Like you do some Amazon affiliates Amazon, or uh, Amazon yeah. affiliates, something easy, but also to, I think it's more encouragement. Just be like, Oh, you know what? I'm making some money. I can see there's potential to it. But then you're right for, especially a travel blog, something kind of very general like that, you need to have that 100,000 visitors. Yeah, that's right. And the other thing that I think a lot of bloggers don't do, and that has allowed me to grow faster than, than your average bloggers, is they don't invest. They don't, you know, a, I tell people this all the time, and I think most bloggers don't realize that a blog is fundamentally like a startup. You know, you're basically, you're building an asset value and blogs actually, if you can get a blog making money, you can sell it for quite a lot. A blog that makes 3000 a month will sell for about a hundred grand, which blows a lot of people's minds that it's like an asset that you could use to trade for a house somewhere. Um, but a lot of people won't invest early on when they're starting their blog and you'll see people that they will like go out of their way to save like 20 bucks over the course of a year for going for like the cheapest possible host. And then they have no, they, that really hurts you, you know, having this host that's not uh, delivering your site, you know, you have a slower site speed, your visitors leave and because you're not making the investment and even those sort of basic things or a keyword research tool, that's another investment that it's, to me, it's like crazy not to invest in. And a lot of bloggers won't even do that, but I've taken it a few steps further. So I actually have two full-time VAs on the blog that help me with all sorts of stuff. And that's helped me to really focus my time on the parts of it that I'm really good on, which are the writing and the SEO and the sort of promotion of it. And they help with the back end and the design and dealing with affiliate links and the programs and the management and all, all that, all that extra work that when I first started out, that tech stuff was really bogging me down because it's not my skill set. And, you know, hiring help, I think sometimes is, is, you know, as entrepreneurs, it can be very easy to feel like you have to do everything yourself. I agree. And, yeah. um, and the minute that you, you, you start delegating and start hiring, that can be something that really making that investment can really pay off. I definitely agree. And I, I love that. It's, it's really thinking big instead of just thinking as like a small one time, one man show. Uh, where'd you hire your VAs from? So they're all out of the Philippines. Yeah. I've hired on both this and my other company. I've hired 
half dozen people out of the Philippines. And, um, you know, there's a really good site called onlinejobs.ph, which you may have heard of, that's, that's excellent for hiring. Um, it's, you know, one problem with hiring overseas help is if you go to a, a site like Upwork or Fiverr, they're just messes, you know, they're messes for the freelancers and they're messes for the, um, for the client side. So you try to hire somebody and there's just, you'll literally get like a hundred applications for like a posting with, even if it's just like a small research thing, like I want five hours of research done, hundred people will apply within two hours. And that's not good for anybody. You can't read all those postings and it doesn't lead to the sort of long-term sustained um, work. And so I like to, I, I, I found that it's a lot better to sort of hire people full time, keep them on, train them, get them used to the business. They understand our systems. We have processes in place and all of that. And, um, and so, yeah, just that, that one side of the Philippines has, has been, um, really good. You know, you can hire pretty good, uh, pretty good VAs out of the Philippines. There's a lot of people who hire VAs out of the Philippines. English proficiency level is amazing in the Philippines. And so it's very easy to communicate with, uh, with our, our, our folks over there. And they're just, I mean, the level of talent, the two people I have right now are just incredible. I, I love it. Yeah. I, I'm a big fan of, uh, Filipino VAs as well. And I think that's a great idea to have them all full time. I think that is the key move. Like in the beginning, you might not have enough things for them to do, but find things for them to do. Oh yeah, there's so much. We've done so much more. I mean, I've started to get into, I avoided doing video for the longest time because I hate the editing. And then I asked one of my VAs and turns out she's a pretty proficient video editor. And so that's allowed me to do so much more because now I can shoot the, shoot the, uh, shoot, just shoot the video, send it over to her and she spits back like a fully edited thing. And it's incredible. Cool. I like it. So real quick, you, what's your other business? Uh, so I have a software company. Um, it's called uh, Collection Harbor and we are a, um, a B2B startup that provides an inventory management solution for museums, which I know sounds about as far away from uh, the travel blog side of things as it can get. And it's a funny story how I went there. It's a business I have with a couple partners, one of whom is in the museum space, which is where the idea came from. And so we have a um, a small MVP product um, and some initial clients. We've just uh, come out after almost two years of development, came out with that a few months ago. Um, and so we're in the sort of go-to-market phase right now. Wow, cool. And you're also launching a course? Uh, yeah, so on the travel blog side, um, you know, we, uh, we have a course called the Travel Lifestyle Course that's meant as sort of an introduction to digital nomad life. There's a lot of courses out there on digital nomad um, on different subjects of digital nomad life. But what I wanted to do was make one that sort of walks through all of the questions that I get all the times from readers who are like, I want to do this, but I don't know how to make friends while I'm traveling abroad. I don't, I, you'd be, people are concerned about the, uh, taxes or health insurance, or they don't understand sort of the lay of the land of how the, re the remote economy works in terms of all of the different types of jobs that you can do and the difference between being a freelancer and an entrepreneur or a remote worker. And so I wanted to just sort of give an intro course that laid all of that out for people because I've done a lot of one-on-one -on -one counseling um, just to followers as sort of gratis over the years. And at some point somebody was like, you know, you should just like do a course for this. So I, I just, we just finished building the course. I, I, we put a lot of work into it. I hired all these guest instructor nomads to come on and teach lessons on specific subjects. Facebook ads or search engine marketing or whatever their specific skill set was, because of course I can't talk about everything. And oh my gosh, it's so much work. I don't know if I'll ever do another online course. Like you start it and then you realize four months later that making 50 videos and 50 lessons is unbelievably difficult. Especially on something that broad. Yeah. That's why I never, I've never made a digital nomad course. It's just like, there's so much to talk about. It's, it's almost like saying like, creating a course on like, how to adult. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it is nuts, you know, and we've, but you know, I brought in a lot of people to do some of the, the lessons and I, thankfully I didn't have to do any of the video editing because that would have just totally killed me. Um, but we've, you know, we finally finished, um, building it all. And I think it's, I think it's a really good pr product and a super comprehensive, uh, product for people who are starting out. And so I'm glad to finally have it done. I, I, again, I don't know that I'll do another one, but I feel really good about the product we produced. Okay, cool. So they want to check out that course or your blog uh, in general and the Emerging Destinations Awards. How can they find you? Uh, so you can find all of this at travellemming.com, um, which is lemming like the animal. Sometimes people he'll hear lemon like the citrus fruit. Um, <laughs> and lemmings are animals that follow each other supposedly off cliffs to their deaths, which is the whole sort of joke about over tourism. 
Um, that's a lie, by the way, perpetrated by the Disney Corporation in a 1950s documentary where they murdered a bunch of lemmings. Um, so seriously, this is a true story, just for cinematic effect. So travel lemming, um, and if you pop that into Google, I will, of course, pop up. If I don't, my SEO is, is having some problems. <laughs> All right, so check it out, uh, Google travel lemming, or go to travellemming.com. Nate, it's been, been really fun, man. Yeah, thanks for having me on, Johnny. Really appreciate it. Yeah, and I'm excited to check out some of these new destinations. And for you guys listening, thanks so much for subscribing to the podcast, as well as sharing with your friends. If you like this episode, uh, take a screenshot, send it to your friends, and leave a review on iTunes, because that helps tremendously really appreciate you guys and see you somewhere in the world bye guys thank you for listening to the travel like a boss podcast if you want to hear more including the bonus how to choose the perfect niche episode join our mailing list at travel like a boss podcast.com see you next week and remember if you want to travel like a boss you need to be your own boss so start your online business today and start living the lifestyle you've always dreamed of